This video is brought to you by Squarespace. Stick around to the end of the video for a special offer they're making available through my channel. Okay, so here's the headline. I love this thing and I totally recommend it. That's it. That's the review. There's no buts or qualifications. It's just a straight up excellent title that I think a lot of people will enjoy more than they expect that they would enjoy it. I think this will be a pleasant surprise for many people who take a chance on it because it was a really pleasant surprise for me. Now I know what's going to happen in the comment section of this video. It's going to be like, eh, you didn't like Valhalla, but you like this. It's the same open world Ubisoft garbage. Eh. Shut up. Saying these two games are alike, it's like saying the Sopranos and the Godfather are the same because they're both about Italians. Yes, they are both open world map marker driven games made by Ubisoft, but that's pretty much where the similarities end. Valhalla is an open world RPG that will take you a minimum of like 70 hours to get through, where Immortal Phoenix Rising is an open world adventure game that will take you around 25 hours to get through. Valhalla is like The Witcher 3, sort of, where Immortal is like open world Jack and Daxter. And as I said, I loved it. I think the writing is going to make more than a few people cry cringe, but I appreciate the fact that it swung for the fences and I found it funny. I think the combat is excellent as its abilities and upgrades each fold into my existing combat loop rather than interrupt it. The structure is genuinely open world as I can go almost anywhere I like at all times rather than needing to follow a set campaign path. The exploration is real exploration where I need to use my eyes rather than just ping the environment and walk over to the flashing thing. The progression pathways all provide meaningful expansions to my gameplay without feeling compulsory, incentivizing me to clear map markers without ever forcing me to do so. The puzzles are so well constructed and continue to engage you even towards the tail end of the game. Sitting at the heart of all of this is a sense of possibility that you don't get in other Ubisoft games. Like you play through Far Cry or Watch Dogs or Assassin's Creed and you get a read on them very early on. You, you've kind of seen it all in the first 10 or so hours. Here you really don't know what's around the next corner as you play through this. As each new character you meet breathes new life into the story, each new dungeon introduces you to new puzzle mechanics, each new zone plays out entirely differently from the last zone. It's the least Ubisoft feeling game I've played from Ubisoft in a long time. And it's kind of bad that that's a compliment, but it's true. Immortal Phoenix Rising was just a great surprise and I'm actually really looking forward to telling you more about it in this review. So let's get to it. Immortal Phoenix Rising tells the story of Phoenix, a mortal who was shipwrecked in the land of the gods. His crewmates, including his brother, have all been turned to stone and so he sets out on his own Greek odyssey to save them. Standing in his way is Typhon, the big baddie of Greek mythology who manages to win a momentary upper hand in his war against the gods. He's captured the essence of a number of them and in their weakened state they're powerless against him. Surprise, surprise, it's up to you to get them back into fighting shape so that they'll be more ready for the final battle than Nate Robinson was. He's trying to get Nate oh, oh. Now this is a pretty stock standard setup and you're probably thinking, eh, story, who cares? Look, I'm here to tell you that this story, this writing is probably going to make or break the game for a lot of people because of how in your face it is. This is not just some window dressing so you can get on with the map marker clearing. Ubisoft really went all out with this and since there's so much of it and because all of it is so much, it's definitely going to impact how much you like or dislike this game. The entire thing is actually narrated by Prometheus and Zeus. Prometheus is chained to a rock and he's recounting the story to Zeus and there's this back and forth between the two of them that is unceasing. Like, you'll discover a cave and then Prometheus will be like, and then Phoenix discovered a cave. By the way, the voice of Phoenix is the same voice actor as Adam Jensen from Deus Ex, so the gods will be like, you're the only one with the power to save us, and then Phoenix will be like, I never asked for this. Anyway, if you're finding my jokes obnoxious, then this review is the perfect warm up for the game, because every utterance here is generally either a wisecrack, or is leading up to a wisecrack, or reacting to a wisecrack. It's just constantly trying to be funny, trying to make a joke of everything. And as I said, this is surely going to rub a few people the wrong way if the humor isn't to your particular taste. Personally, I actually really liked it a lot. I appreciated the fact that it was always trying to engage me. I didn't find all of it funny and sometimes, yeah, I wish they would just shut up and let me get on with it. But on balance, I appreciated the fact that they really tried to infuse 
All of this with a lot of personality. I think one of the hallmarks of many Ubisoft games is that they're sort of tonally flat. No one will accuse Immortal Phoenix Rising of being flat. I'm sure some people will accuse it of being annoying, but no one will call it flat as its bizarre cast of characters put it all on the line to keep you smiling, whether you feel like smiling or not. One thing that I think is more objectively great is how much you learn about Greek mythology as you play through this. Hades is an interesting point of comparison here, which was less overt in its recounting of tales. Hades sort of relied on your existing knowledge of Greek mythology, putting a more personal and emotional lens over a number of those stories. Here in Immortal, there's no knowledge assumed. The game introduces you to its gods, tells you what they're about, and shares not one or two stories about them, but dozens. It feels like the boat rides with Kratos and his son where Mimir recounts the stories of the Norse world. Here, Prometheus will often just break into a story about some god while you're in the middle of completing a puzzle, which not only deepens your connection to the world and these characters, but it's also just nice to listen to, and it's interesting, and it's well done. And that's the bottom line for me when it comes to the writing. I think it's really well done. I mean, more than a few AAA games sort of shy away from any kind of writing that might feel too invasive or too distracting, this game just says, fuck that. It actually feels like a 25 hour long Disney cartoon, and that's not gonna be for everyone, but it was actually one of the things that I appreciated about this game the most. All right, so I know what you've been thinking while watching the footage of this review. This is just a Genshin Impact clone, am I right? Do you honestly think you're fucking funny? So the visual comparisons to other grass-based RPGs are inescapable, but that doesn't stop Immortal from being a very, very good-looking game that runs beautifully, at least on Xbox Series X, which is where I reviewed it. Now, one thing I want to note is that the color you're seeing here isn't quite right. It turns out that Adobe Premiere Pro has a real problem with footage from this game and refuses to import it properly. As a result, Result, the color is about 90% right, but you can expect it to look slightly better when you boot it up on your own machine. So I played this game for about 25 hours, and in that time I had a total of, I think, three crashes, and that was pretty much it in terms of bugs or issues. I didn't have any bugged quests, no audio issues, I don't think I had any frame drops. It was pretty much just perfect the whole way through, which if you've played Assassin's Creed Valhalla recently is going to come as a welcome surprise. When I played a preview of Immortals a few months back, I was impressed by its performance on PC and commented that, hey, this is looking really good, and it seems to have held the line here for consoles as well. This really does seem like one of Ubisoft's most polished titles ever, at least on Xbox Series X, so hats off to them for making that happen. Visually, the game looks spectacular. Much of its impact rests in its draw distances, where it feels like every inch of the world is viewable no matter where you're standing. The land of the gods feels like a sort of valley that's yours to behold wherever you feel like it. And I never tired of taking in its color, its detail and its monuments. And this really is Monument Valley as the landscape is littered with the giant colossi of the deities you serve, the temples built to them, the massive forges where they toil and a range of other striking landmarks to explore. More than just because of visual splendor though, I really loved exploring this world because of its density. Generally speaking, you'll never go more than a few seconds without bumping into something to do or see. The island you're exploring is divided into seven parts. The first is just the starter zone where you'll meet some characters, get to grips with the controls and get hold of your weapons. The four largest zones are the main event, each of them the domain of a god who needs your help to retrieve their essence and restore their power. The northernmost zone isn't Mount Olympus, but it's kind of like Mount Olympus, maybe? While the central zone is a surprise that I won't spoil for you. Now, what you're already seeing here is that this is a small world. There aren't 85 different zones that all look basically the same. There are five zones that all look different. The lush greenery of Aphrodite's zone, the civilized structure of Athena's, the war-torn wasteland where Ares resides, the industrial forge lands of Hephaestus. These zones all look distinct from one another such that when you arrive in a new area, you're like, hey, this looks different. That's a nice feeling after playing other open world games. The density of these spaces is another thing that makes them great. You don't have to ride for minutes on end to arrive at something to do. Everything, be it map markers or the quests, are also tightly packed together. You can leapfrog from one thing to the next, completing some side activity, and then just using your eyes to see something else nearby that you might want to do. And then you can walk over to it and you can do it. 
And this is really a critical point about how you engage this world versus other open world games. Here, there are no map markers to begin with. You can't climb a statue and sink to it to immediately see everything on the map. What you need to do instead is find a high vantage point and then look with your eyes to see things. And once you tag them, then they're on your map. Now, this can get a little cheesy since you kind of have x-ray vision while you're doing this and you can see through solid rock, but at least at some step towards getting the player to survey the space with their own eyes, rather than just looking at the map, setting a waypoint on the markers and then going there. When you have decided that you want to go somewhere to unlock a chest or collect some resource, you don't just go there and then do the whole ping the environment thing. I officially hate this mechanic now. I hate the mechanic where you just press the R3 button and the interactive objects are all highlighted so you don't actually need to look around or think. You just walk over to the glowing thing. That is the worst, most destructive mechanic in open world games because it conditions the player to never actually look for anything. We just become slaves to this ping and level designers are slaves to it as well as they make no effort to design spaces that can be examined without the aid of this ping. I hate this mechanic so much now. Anyway, Immortal doesn't do that. When you go somewhere, you have to look around and find the thing with your own eyes. If you get to a puzzle, there's no hand-holding. There's no pinging the environment to see which objects you can interact with. No on-screen prompts to tell you what to do. You just need to figure it out. So here, when I'm trying to refire the Forge of Hephaestus, I'm not explicitly told how to do that. But after a while, I see that there are chunks of coal laying around. I see that there's a space in the burner where I could put them. And I see that there's fire, which I could use to set my arrows alight. So I put two and two and two together, and I lit the forge, all on my own, just like a big boy. Immortals doesn't tell you where to go. You need to find these locations for yourself. And when you get there, it doesn't tell you what to do. You need to figure it out. And that's how it should be in open world games and in most video games in general, to be honest. You know what else is cool about this world? You can go pretty much anywhere you want to. Yes, there's no level gating at all, which means that you can do the four main zones in any order you please. There are enemies with more HP than others as denoted by their health bars, but they're either easily avoided or easily overcome owing to a combat system that focuses more on skill than it focuses on raw stats, but we'll come back to that later. Again, an open world game is not actually open world if it's just shuttling you along a set path from which you're not allowed to deviate. That's just linear level design dressed up as open world design. Like Breath of the Wild or The Outer Wilds, Immortal gives you the freedom to take your own path or even switch paths at any time should you wish to. Here's something else that's cool. There's no quest log in this game. There are main quests for each zone, but they keep all the information on the map since that's enough. There are side quests in the game, but there are very few of them because each of them is an actual quest with dialogue and bosses and, you know, some work put into it. I did every single side quest during my playthrough since there was only about two or three of them in each zone and they each felt worthy of my time. It was the main quest though that really impressed me, in particular how different each zone played out from the other. There's an overall structure to it which is that you go there, you meet the god you need to help out, you do some stuff for them, complete their final dungeon to secure their essence, etc. But the order in which all of that plays out and the stuff you're doing along the way is never the same. In Aphrodite zone you'll recreate her creation myth, sort of, by rolling a giant pearl into the sea. And then you'll collect the tears she shed at the death of Adonis to try and free her. In Athena's zone, you'll walk the footsteps of the great heroes Achilles, Odysseus, and Heracles, accomplishing tasks and felling foes that mimic their labors. Hephaestus' zone is just one giant forge that must be relit. Almost the entire zone is one elaborate puzzle that must be slowly solved bit by bit. The ascension to King's Peak is different again from all the other zones in ways that I won't spoil, but it's just great. This is what I was talking about when I spoke about this spirit of possibility, the surprise factor. I mean, after five hours of Watch Dogs, I knew what to expect for the remaining 25 hours. I mean, they had some great mission design there, and I actually quite enjoyed that game. But it had a beat that you could quickly tap into, and you knew how the rest of the song went. 
It's just not like that here with Immortal Phoenix Rising. One of the biggest sources of enjoyment I had when playing this was the anticipation of what was coming next. I was so excited to begin the journey into each new zone because I wondered what new landscape I'd discover, which characters I'd meet, which stories I'd hear, which new quests I'd be sent on. And in 25 hours, I never felt the game let me down in this regard. I never felt like it was just phoning in more content or stretching things out just to add more playtime. And if you've ever played a Ubisoft game, you'd know that's generally not how they roll. In addition to a story I enjoyed and a world I loved exploring, I was consistently impressed by the nuts and bolts of Immortals gameplay, that is the puzzles and the combat. Now, if you've played Breath of the Wild or Darksiders or Legacy of Kain's Soul Reaver, you're going to be quite familiar with how Immortal handles puzzles. Scattered throughout the broader world and within dozens of shrines, you'll encounter puzzles of varying complexity that will test your smarts. They're a combination of platforming, block puzzles, time switches, and physics-based puzzles that aren't anything new, but they are consistently great. I remember thinking to myself very often how impressed I was at the puzzle design as new mechanics were introduced regularly and the limits of those new mechanics would continue to be pushed as I plunged deeper into each new dungeon and into each new zone. There are perhaps a dozen basic mechanics, things like setting your arrows on fire to light torches or moving heavy objects onto switches or changing the direction of the wind to move objects, but Ubisoft found a way to make each new puzzle relying on these core mechanics feel fresh either by utilizing the mechanic in some unique way or by combining mechanics together. There's a lot of lateral thinking required here and I was definitely stumped on a few of these puzzles but never for long. These puzzles are not arduous or finicky or frustrating or unclear. They are generally elegant in their design with a solution that seems entirely fair and clear and straightforward once you arrive at it. Much of this elegance is owed to how clearly things are explained to you. Ubisoft have done a terrific job of introducing new mechanics into the mix, not through long, drawn-out tutorials or text boxes, but through the simple act of showing the player how things work. Each dungeon that introduces a new mechanic will always begin with a short sample puzzle that allows the player to see for themselves how this new mechanic works. And after that, the player just has to apply this learning in various forms. This goes back to that fundamental building block of good game design, which is that it's fun to apply our learning to things. It's why Breath of the Wild shrines are so consistently engaging. It's the bedrock foundation of why the Outer Wilds were so incredible. Being told what to do is nowhere near as fun as figuring it out for ourselves, and Immortals never loses sight of that. I have had a disproportionate amount of fun with Immortals Combat, I really have. I feel like I shouldn't have enjoyed it as much as I did because it's not that good and there isn't anything particularly innovative about it, but it's just really well done. You have two weapons, a sword for fast light attacks and an axe which is slower, does more damage and builds stagger. When you stagger a target, they're knocked down for a time and they'll take extra damage. There's a bow which is not particularly useful. You dodge, you can parry, you can air combo stuff and there are some abilities. That's it, very simple. But the brilliance of the combat is actually in the finer details, stuff that you wouldn't notice unless you're really paying attention to it. So first up is the animation cancelling, which means I can start an attack and then abandon it to switch to a dodge or a jump or a parry if I need to suddenly react to what an enemy's doing. This keeps combat feeling really snappy and responsive at all times. Next up is the way enemies are designed. There's quite a few of them and they each bring something unique to the table, so they're interesting to fight either alone or together. And they all have both visual and audio telegraphs so that you know when to expect their attacks, which means that you can outplay them. Next up are the abilities, which are great because most of them are folded into your combos rather than interrupting them, and they typically have a few layers to their utility. Athena's shield charge will help you cross distance really quickly, allowing you to get out of a tough spot faster than you otherwise could. It also has a stun at the end of it, so you can interrupt enemies while they're charging up their attacks. Same goes with Ares' phalanx, which not only knocks enemies in the air, but it can also help me avoid damage. I began to use these abilities as mobility tools as often as I use them as offensive damage tools and it all just flowed so well. And then there's the dodge window where if you nail it, it will slow down time. Now I know I said this was bad in Assassin's Creed because it was, it just broke combat because you know, all the enemies would die in like two or three hits, it was silly. But here it really works because enemies have a large amount of health, meaning that a single dodge window is not enough to KO them. But it does give you the space to lay down some serious damage. This dodge window is actually the biggest thing that stops enemies from feeling too 
spongy in this game, and that opens up a window for skills-based combat rather than just raw stats overpowering things, since it's possible to take on any opponent in the game so long as you've mastered this mechanic. It doesn't hurt that the game's progression path is really well calibrated. You'll spend a bit of time clearing map markers to get enough coins to unlock all your abilities, but once you've done that, you really don't need to do much more. The additional ability augments just make stuff stronger or add some additional effects, but you don't need them. They aren't compulsory. You can just stick with the basic combat stuff if you like, so you're not forced to farm map markers, but if you want to enjoy everything the combat framework has to offer, then you're incentivized to get out there into the open world and collect some stuff, which I think is a perfectly acceptable balance. If I have one criticism, it's that the gear is a little disappointing. Most of it offers up minor stat increases that don't really make themselves felt enough in combat. You can get sets that restore resources like stamina or health or that reward perfect parries, but none of it will make you legitimately excited that you picked it up. It's just there and it's fine, but it's also pretty easy to forget, which is a bit of a shame. Uh, it also has transmog though, which is nice. So you can pick up any item and then make it look like any other item, which is a nice touch. The last thing I'll say is that it's a real pleasure to play this game, which is a weird thing to say, but it's true. And it's a combination of so many things, but they all coalesce to form such a seamless, frictionless experience that just feels like you're always playing the game and having fun with it rather than pushing through its annoying components to get to the fun. Traversal is a really good example. You have some wings and you can glide pretty much anywhere. So rather than traversal being boring, it's fun to run around in this world and just jump when you're on a slight incline and open your wings and sail down. That's fun. I never got bored of that. If you do need to get somewhere fast, you can just hold the Y button at any time to immediately summon a horse without ever breaking stride. You can loot while you're on your horse and there's an upgrade which gives you area looting so you can quickly loot all items in an area instead of picking them up one by one. You can go anywhere you like at any time because there's no level gating. There's no enemy you'll encounter that you can't kill so long as you've mastered the dodge mechanic because there's no like enemy stat things where they're basically invulnerable unless you're high enough level. There's no puzzle you'll encounter that isn't properly explained to you. There's no frustrating roadblocks thrown up because of bad, incomplete, or lazy design. Even the progression curve is just so damn pleasant. I never went out with the intention of farming anything. I just picked stuff up as I went, and I had just the right amount of materials to get my weapons nearly fully upgraded, my skill tree nearly fully unlocked, the potions that I cared about nearly fully upgraded, etc. The whole game is just so pleasant to roll through. It never feels like work, which again, if you've played a Ubisoft game, is generally not how their games feel. Bottom line, I think this is great. It's a short, sharp 25 hours that you could push to 40 hours if you were a completionist, since there are plenty of shrines and puzzles I didn't do. There's also a new game plus mode when you finish it, so you can go back and do it all again with all of your abilities, etc., upgraded, unlocked. But brevity is the order of the day here, not bloat. You know, a lot of people were at me about my Valhalla review and they were like, oh, you just don't like open world games. One of my favorite games of the year was Ghost of Tsushima, which was basically Assassin's Creed Japan. Before that, there was a like Spider-Man PS4, which is another open world map marker game that everyone loves. No one was like, oh, Spider-Man would have been so much better if it was 70 hours long. It's not about the length. It's about knowing when to step off, knowing when to say that's enough. Knowing when you've reached the point when you can no longer surprise the player with things they haven't yet seen or experienced. That's it for me when it comes to most games. That's one of Immortal's biggest strengths. It's constantly surprising the player with new characters, new regions, new puzzles, new quests, new enemies. And when it can't do that anymore, when it has no surprises left, it ends. If you've got a blog or a hobby or a business idea that you want to take to the next level, then Squarespace is your best bet. Squarespace offers the world's best set of custom website design tools, allowing absolute beginners to immediately begin creating professional looking websites. They don't just look good either. They have almost everything your website will need for both you and the people viewing it. Stuff like appointment scheduling for clients or traffic overview so you can see how many people are visiting your site. You can schedule posts so that you can put 
future content in the pipeline, and you can even build a comment section so you can begin building an online community. Head to squarespace.com for a free trial, and when you're ready to launch your idea, go to squarespace.com forward slash skill up to get 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Thanks to Squarespace for sponsoring the video, and thank you for watching it. Thanks for watching my video. If you liked it, give it a thumbs up. If you didn't, give it a thumbs down so I know to do better for next time. If you enjoyed yourself, consider subscribing. And if you really enjoyed yourself, maybe consider hitting that notification bell so you never miss a video. You can see my patrons here on the left. They're awesome. They're amazing. If you want to join them, check out my Patreon page. Thank you again. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.